This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good afternoon, I'm Claire Brindis and I'm the director of the Philip R. Lee Institute for Health Policy Studies. And on behalf of all the co-sponsors of today's event, I'm really delighted to welcome you and to welcome our very special guest, Carolyn Clancy. And also that we're very pleased that Dee Dee Eisenberg is here uh, um, to uh, partake in today's activities. We're grateful that she came. We're also very pleased and happy to welcome Dr. Alice Adams to the 2009 recipient of the John M. Eisenberg Excellence in Mentorship Award that ARC established in the year 2001. The wish to honor John Eisenberg was really an, a desire and inspiration to honor the man, his values, his vision, and all the contributions. And that brought us as several Bay Area research institutions, Stanford and UC Berkeley, and also the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Research Institute and UCSF and its leaders to really think about how do we continue this legacy of this remarkable man. And so we were very fortunate that we were able to speak to a wonderful colleague, Mark Smith, at the California Healthcare Foundation, who will be speaking to you very shortly, but also to really think about how do we honor, how do we continue this legacy? And a great part of that desire was to choose on an annual basis someone who exemplified and who continues the legacy of that work both from the perspective of research and the perspective of policy, and the bridge between the translation of research and policy so that we can actually use evidence-based practices in the delivery of healthcare and in the formulation of new initiatives and new efforts to improve the health of the public. So in that spirit and in recognition of that legacy and on behalf of all of the conveners, I'd like to introduce to you Mark Smith. Uh, thank you. First, it is an enormous pleasure to have Dee Dee Eisenberg here. Welcome. It's nice to see you. Um, some of you knew John Eisenberg. I knew John well. I, I, my office was maybe 20 feet from his for most of the three years that I was at the University of Pennsylvania. And a number of us in this room, Carol and Bob and others, uh, were mentees and protégés and colleagues, but anybody who cares about general internal medicine, anybody who cares about health services research, anybody who cares about health policy in action uh, owes a professional debt as well as a personal debt to John Eisenberg, who um, I won't repeat all the, the eulogies and, and the accolades, but he was a remarkable person. There, there aren't many people that one can think of who virtually created a field, and John was one of a handful of people who created those fields and who exemplified not only the highest standards of academic excellence, but a personal fidelity to that mission. Um, that is the reason why we've all named things after him and why he lives uh, still today. So it's a pleasure for the foundation to be able to support these many institutions located around the Bay Area. Uh, those of us who live in the Bay Area are fortunate for many reasons. The good news is we have lots of people who are leaders in these fields. The bad news is I guess they're scattered over four or five different institutions. <laughs> but at least once a year they come together for this occasion and it's fitting that it should be uh, to honor John's legacy and to hear from those who are carrying it on. Uh, and this year we're grateful to Carolyn for um, interrupting her enormously complicated schedule to be to be with us. So uh, I'll be quiet and ask Steve uh, to do the honors. Welcome to everyone. Thanks for being here.
Thank you, Mark, very much, and particularly for uh, some of those remembrances of, of John. And uh, today, I think, is really a very special occasion because we have the opportunity to uh, thank and, and honor uh, one of his mentees, who in many respects probably uh, was closest to him, uh, certainly professionally in her work, standing by his side for five years, and then uh, picking up the mantle and continuing the remarkable leadership that John gave the Agency for Health Research and Quality. And I think if John were here today, and he is certainly in our memories, uh, he would be so enormously pleased and gratified by the work that Carolyn and her colleagues have done. And it couldn't come at a more opportune time uh, in our nation's history as we now have the opportunity with the Affordable Care Act uh, to really make a pervasive and lasting change uh, in our delivery system uh, that will contribute uh, to uh, you know, the health of all of us. Uh, so it's really great that uh, I think we're being able to honor uh, Carolyn and John's memory, and if John again were here, he might say, uh, well, it's about time, you know, <laughs> right under, and to which we would reply, absolutely, it's about time, but also it reflects the fact that there are so many outstanding individuals working in this field uh, who have received the honor of the uh, Eisenberg Legacy Lectureship and many more as well. And uh, John helped to build that, and Carolyn has carried that on, and we really get the opportunity uh, to thank her today and benefit from some of her comments. Let me say a little bit about Carolyn. I won't go on terribly long. Uh, many of us uh, know her, of course, but uh, she started her uh, training. Uh, well, she's first of all a graduate of uh, Boston College and then UMass Medical School. She was a Kaiser Family Foundation Fellow uh, for uh, a year or so at the University of Pennsylvania, so there's an original connection. And before jo joining ARC in 1990, uh, she was at the Medical College of Virginia. Uh, she now uh, holds an appointment at GW. She's senior associate editor at Health Services Research and is on the board of a number of other journals as well. She's an elected member of the Academy of Medicine, or the Institute of Medicine, and a master of the American College of Physicians in 2004. And in 2009, for her own research, she was presented with the William Graham Prize for Health Services Research, which is generally acknowledged one of the top honors in her field. As you know, her research ranges broadly, but mostly focuses on quality and outcomes of care, particularly around reducing disparities and around issues of patient safety. In that regard, she's published about 150 publications. And I just want to cite uh, three of them here uh, in terms of her co-author. So the first one here is Clancy and Eisenberg. Outcomes Research, Measuring the End Results of Healthcare, which appeared in Science in 1998. Second article, Clancy and Eisenberg. Outcomes Research at the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, which appeared in Disease Management and Clinical Outcomes, also in 1998. And there was a third one, uh, also Clancy and Eisenberg, Emergency Medicine in Population, Population-Based Systems of Care. We talk about population health management now. That appeared in the Annals of Emergency Medicine in 1997. Now, I don't know, Carolyn, why it's always Clancy and Eisenberg whether that's just the alphabetical, or whether you and John arm twisted over that, or whether you were clearly the senior author and just carrying him along for the, for the ride, so to speak. Uh, but that's uh, some example of uh, Carolyn's publications uh, in her work with John. But I also want to say a little bit about Carolyn's other achievements uh, leading the Agency for Health Research and Quality. And uh, in particular, I want to call out uh, four or five of these, and I think she'll probably expand on at least some of these in her remarks with us today. First of all, we now have, for the first time in this country, a national report to Congress on the quality of care in the United States. And along with that, a national report on disparities as well. And uh, those two reports really were foundational in setting the stage for the Affordable Care Act in 
and some of its features, particularly in regard to its quality strategy. Secondly, she has raised to, I think, a, a new level the, the TRIP program, translating research into practice, focusing on gaps that have identified uh, by various reports, and in particular on developing practical tools and strategies for dealing with some of the issues. Third, in an area that needs a lot more work, but things are beginning to happen, is the work on reducing hospital-acquired infections. And the best example is a nationwide work on central line infections in the intensive care unit, some of Peter Pronovus's work in Michigan that shows a 41% reduction uh, in hospital central line infections, real money, real lives being saved, it's been sustained. Uh, one of our local leaders in our Sutter Health System, uh, Gordon Hunt, who himself is a or was a critical care specialist, has remarked that these results changed our idea of what is possible. How many of us remember just in articles a year ago of people saying, well, of course we need to do a lot better in that. I'm looking at Bob, for example. But, you know, you can't get it to zero. We're human. There's always going to be a few. And, you know, in John's spirit... Carolyn and others saying, no, it is possible to get it to zero. And if it flips up, that's a real anomaly. We need to go back to work on that and get it back to zero. So this is a major effort. Another one is the hospital consumer assessment of health plans. Uh, controversial, right? But now it's very much being used in value-based purchasing for hospitals. And then, again, the evolution of the evidence-based practice reports with a lot of stakeholder engagement as those are being formed. And I would remind us that she and her colleagues have done all of this with a very modest budget, 300 plus million a year, right? And one of her colleagues and says that the agency that Carolyn often refers uh, to ARC as the, uh, quote, little engine that could, the little engine that, that could, right, punching above the weight, playing above the rim, and that is clearly the case. And one of her, her staff, all, which really sums up, uh, I think, uh, our, a lot of our experience with her and why she has meant so much for our field, says she has untiringly led her staff to support and conduct research and to produce practical guides and tools that have had nationwide and even international impact. So with that, I would also add she has an absolutely delightful, slightly witty sense of humor, uh, which uh, I'm sure is standard in good stead. I don't know if we'll see evidence of that today. Uh, but I just would like to add that practically everyone in this room, if not all of us, uh, have benefited from Carolyn Clancy's leadership of ARC. Carolyn? Well, Steve, wow, thank you so much for that introduction. I almost feel like we should just stop and go right to the reception. Because, <laughs> but uh, very, very much appreciated. And it is really a thrill to be here to honor John. Um, I think many of you know that actually I go to work every day in the John M. Eisenberg building in uh, Rockville, Maryland. And I know some of you have probably had a dark question at the back of your brain, so I thought I'd resolve it now. A lot of people wanted to know, they'd pull me aside, uh, so how do you get that? That done in the federal government. Well, it turns out that the federal government is, has been into leasing for quite some time, and the landlord really doesn't care what we call the building. Um, we could call it Harry as long as the uh, rent checks keep uh, coming in. Um, but he had a dramatic impact on so many people. And if there's one thing I remember uh, from when John died, it was how many people we heard from, people who just had to reach out and tell us that they'd met John at a meeting, they'd worked worked on a project with him, and oftentimes this was a quick conversation, but they had to share that experience. And I must say that the conversation I had with a variety of people today from very different perspectives over lunch, which was uh, very energizing, and Adams Dudley served as a, I think as he was putting it, a uh, Fox, CN, MSNB, 
NBC uh, sort of moderator of the crowd, um, you know, made me realize uh, just once again how exciting health services research is and needs to be. But I also think health services research is kind of at a critical crossroads these days. If you live and work in the nation's capital, it is very, very common to hear health care systems come and they rent the National Press Club and they've announced that uh, they have figured it all out. They produce knock your socks off quality at a very low cost and then they go home. And no one asks them any questions like, can you show me any results? They just write a little story because they're a famous, well-known system, so it must be true. Um, and of course, we track this stuff all the time. We've got the data, and so far, there just aren't enough of them to be making a blip. But there's so much energy and excitement right now that um, the Nike approach, right, just do it, uh, seems to be uh, predominant right at the moment. So I wanted to just spend some time with you and also get your feedback on where health services research is and uh, what we've done well and what we can do better. Um, so this is uh, John on uh, translation of evidence, that evidence is necessary but uh, not sufficient and the findings of research need to be translated into information that's useful for each healthcare decision maker. Um, some days it feels like we have many, many, many healthcare decision makers, but uh, that's mostly a good thing, so although sometimes it's a little bit noisy. Um, and if there's one theme that he struck a lot all the time, it was telling the story. And he would often challenge trainees and uh, grantees and say, does your mother understand what you do? Um, <coughs> I heard another funny story about John's mother asking someone once what John did, but that, I won't get into that today. Um, but it was a big, big challenge to us because it is fairly technical. It's not the kind of thing that you necessarily hear people talking about on the BART or the Metro in uh, Washington. But if there's one book that people talk about a lot, it's Doctors' Decisions and the Cost of Medical Care. Wow, talk about an enduring theme. To this day, uh, we're still having uh, that conversation conversation. So what is health services research? Uh, when John first became a director of the agency, which was then AHCPR and became ARC in uh, 99, um, he did quite a bit of writing on this topic and for somewhat different journal audiences. And um, I thought it would be useful to refer to a couple of definitions. So my personal favorite is the 51 or 52 word definition, the first one here, uh, shared by the Institute of Medicine, Academy, Health, and ARC. Um, and the reason I'm saying 51 or two, it depends on whether you count well-being as one word or two. Um, that's comprehensive, and no one is left out. Very, very inclusive. Um, it's quite a mouthful, though, isn't it? Um, and the second one gets into a little bit, a little bit more succinct. Cuts it by more than half. Um, this comes from some work that our training uh, centers did together to try to figure out what are the core competencies of the people that we're training in this field. And in fact, one of the core competencies that everyone agreed on, which I was very excited about, is that communication and dissemination needs to be a core competency. So the good news is that's it. It's codified in this report. And it's the basis of a lot of discussion among leaders in the field and people who are growing the next generation. The slightly less good news is no one could agree on the content, but that will uh, come next. Um, now, John was also incredibly adept at communicating this to uh, very, very different audiences. So um, I found this, and I, I couldn't believe I'd actually forgotten it. Uh, he used to talk about the pipeline of investment in research. I can't remember if we made this a bumper sticker or not, but we had uh, pictures of it all over the agency. And he thought about the pipeline as having uh, three important components. One was generating new knowledge on important health issues. Um, the middle was about uh, new tools and talent for a new century. This is what you have to say in the late 90s, of course. And uh, the third part was translating uh, research into practice, or TRIP was our word for it. And somehow, magically, out of this faucet came uh, improved outcomes, better quality, uh, great 
greater access, more appropriate and uh, cost-effective use. It doesn't say cost-effective here, but if John had had his way, that's what it would have said. I was a big, big fan of cost-effectiveness analysis. And John knew enough about policy and how it might be possible to go from a really important study and fabulous journal article to either creating policy uh, from the core findings in that study or to how it might affect practice. And I think it was so self-evident to him, but I've come to appreciate over time that actually it's not that self-evident to uh, very many people at all. And in fact, one of the great exciting factors of implementing the Affordable Care Act, which has more provisions around improving quality and care delivery than you could possibly imagine, is actually getting from this very broad idea that we want to do the right thing to specific programs and strategies that help get us there. Um, um, very, very messy business, so it doesn't look quite as neat as uh, this faucet, and I'll come back to that theme a little bit later. So I think the really great news for this field is it's really showtime, right? Um, today, starting in October, part of what hospitals get paid is based on how well they do. There's a new innovation center at CMS. Uh, there's a new patient-centered outcomes research institute. There's just new excitement everywhere. So I actually think the demand for what we recognize as the content of health services research has grown significantly and will continue to grow. Um, and I think some of that demand is going to come from private health care systems. So it's going to be a very different order of business. So it's unlikely that some of these potential partners are, are going to be saying, you know, banging the table and saying, get me a health services researcher. But the stakes are high for them, right? The demands on uh, their enterprise are growing. And the price of making the wrong decision or choosing the wrong path uh, uh, is the risk of that is also high. So health services research brings solutions to that uh, dilemma. But it's also a cultural divide and one that I think we're going to need to think together about uh, how do we cross. Because a lot of these systems have huge, huge dreams of data. And most of them, as far as I can tell, are not terribly interested in a conversation where um, a researcher calls them up and says, can you ship me a file of data because I've got a really cool idea for a project. Um, a project that's of joint interest and joint value, that we could have a conversation about. But I want to know what I get back from it, not just a journal publication, not as I'm standing here at this renowned university that there's anything wrong with journal publications. <laughs> I do want to be really, really clear about that. This is how the field grows and evolves and how we learn. But what I'm saying is that there's a very real practical application as well. Um, and one of the other big inputs uh, when John was uh, leading the agency was the year he testified. And Mr. John Porter, who was uh, representing the North Shore of Chicago, is now chair of the Board of Research America, a very important research advocacy organization, um, asked all of the heads of agencies at HHS, um, what impact is your work having? And to a person, they talked about the number of people they were training. Uh, these days, we would talk about jobs. Um, and they talked about journal articles published and so forth and advancement in academia. But what he said was, no, what we really want to get at is how many people's lives are being bettered by what has been accomplished. In other words, is it being used? Is it being followed? Is it actually being given to patients? And this became such a touchstone for us that several years later, we had a robust discussion at a meeting of nationally renowned people in evidence based medicine, debating whether if you referred to the Porter question, it needed a footnote, or whether it was in such common parlance that you know everyone knew what the Porter question uh, meant. So what I want to talk about is what we're doing well and where we need to improve, and where do we go from here. So this is just a uh, picture of the appropriations uh, history at ARC. This, uh, so you can see we're getting up close to uh, $400 million here. The funky little dip there um, refers to the fact that uh, our 
base core appropriation that we've always gotten has actually dipped a bit, but what we're getting in from the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Trust Fund is actually growing. So the net effect is actually a little bit over uh, $400 million. But you can see it has continued to uh, grow since John's time, and I think he'd be enormously proud of that. And uh, at a glance, uh, the big, big focus areas for us are patient safety. Um, and that includes a growing amount of work in ambulatory care settings and some very, very exciting work uh, going on here at this institution. Um, we've had the privilege for the past, uh, since 2005, of supporting work in evaluating which treatments work for which patients under which circumstances, which we're now calling patient-centered outcomes research. That's supposed to sound friendlier than other terms. Um, and I'll tell you more about that in a couple of minutes. And we make a lot of data available for researchers as a platform for assessing quality of care. And of course, with Kathy McDonald here, I have to acknowledge the very, very strong uh, program we've built in uh, evidence-based uh, practice centers. Now, Steve referred to uh, the inclusion of the patient's perspective on quality of care. You know, CAPS has been a vital enterprise uh, at the agency since about 1995 and has grown to uh, be a tool that's used by many, many settings. But even five or six years ago, when Hospital Compare first, uh, this is CMS's website where you can look up information about quality in hospitals, first included this survey, reporters from some of the leading newspapers asked, so why would we care about that? And I said, well, you know, it actually turns out the patient, we can learn a great deal from what the patients tell us. This is far less about the decor and um, did they think the windows were clean and much more about was information communicated to you in a way that you could understand if you had pain, did someone respond, and did you, did you know what you had to do when you left the hospital, and so forth. And that they could sort of understand. Uh, this headline from the Wall Street Journal very recently, U.S. ties hospital payments to making patients happy. It didn't sound like a terribly friendly article to me. Um, for reasons I can't understand, uh, they focused a lot on a public hospital in Atlanta, Grady Hospital. Anyone here train at Grady? It's a phenomenal uh, institution. And what's very, very interesting about it is the article ends, having started off with just a tight, slightly skeptical uh, edge to it, um, basically describing how the nursing service at Grady has been reorganized. And among other things, every patient who's discharged gets a call either 24 or 48 hours after they've been discharged to make sure that they have got everything that they need. Wow, that sounds like a great idea. And now there's real money attached to that because now there's going to be close to a billion dollars in payments to hospitals are based in part on patient satisfaction because I think the weight for the score that patients give the hospital is about 25%. I should also just note that I have filled out an HCAPS questionnaire, not for fun at the agency, but uh, a few years ago when I had the poor judgment to get sick on vacation. It was short, it all worked out well, but I was quite surprised to actually get my own uh, survey in the mail. Uh, I did write in the comments section, too. Um, before John died, we were in the thick of planning for the launch of the first annual reports on uh, quality and disparities. And they've become very, very valuable uh, inputs to what we do. First, the gaps identified in these reports are a big part of informing our research agenda. And in essence, they keep us honest, right? Because sometimes it's easier to think that we're really, really trying hard and working hard, so we must be doing better. So it's actually good to have some sense of, is that uh, the case. The good news is since 2003 in quality, we've seen statistically significant improvements in care across all settings and populations. The slightly less good news is the magnitude of that improvement uh, is statistically significant, but it wouldn't knock your socks off. Uh, the most recent report, it's about 2.5% overall. Obviously, we see some uh, bigger improvements in areas uh, often associated, for example, with um, public reporting. But that doesn't close the gap altogether uh, as well. And disparities remain far too uh, pervasive in care. Um, in addition to that, we've got state snapshots now, because after all, the response to a national report understandably is, whew, 
I thought we were doing much better than that. And then the second reaction about nanoseconds later is, thank God it's not us. Must be some other yahoos who are bringing the uh, average down because we're doing great here. So the closer you can make the data to being local and where you live, the more helpful it is. Um, we've also learned some very valuable lessons, some of them almost forced on us, uh, about stakeholder engagement uh, in not only just setting priorities for research, but actually how we ought to be asking the questions. Um, for example, we, tra we support the work of the uh, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Their recommendations, they're an independent group, but we provide the scientific support, systematic reviews undergird those recommendations, and some of you may have noticed that they now post uh, draft recommendations for comments and so forth. And a lot of people have a lot to share about these um, recommendations. But what the stakeholders really, really value is that the task force now provides an opportunity when they start a new topic for them to be engaged in framing the questions before the systematic review is done. And oftentimes they bring incredibly important information that you would never get if you knew every single article published in that topic because it's not about that. It's about how people understand what gets covered by insurance because of the link to the Affordable Care Act and so forth. Uh, so we've uh, created what we've called a knowledge transfer program really as a broad umbrella for many learning networks. Works. I would say that the most vital one that we've supported is Medicaid medical directors, who are an amazing group of people. Very senior uh, person in most states, highly variable job description. I have met Medicaid medical directors who told me they were in the job for months before they had any idea what they were supposed to be doing. So this network was a very vital source of mentors for them. And not only are they in a position to use a lot of the findings of our research, but they give us incredibly important feedback because it doesn't matter if you're an internist, right? If you're the Medicaid medical director, you got to know a whole lot about pediatrics too uh, as it relates to policy in your state and so forth. And we've uh, had the opportunity to work with uh, collaboratives across the country, multi-stakeholder, based on the premise that all health care is local, trying to figure out how do they move the needle in their communities. John also once made a point about uh, evidence-based medicine uh, versus eminence-based medicine, right? Uh, that's the model that many of us grew up with. I'd like to say it's extinct. I'm not altogether sure people here at UCSF can uh, tell me afterwards uh, if that model has gone away. But I vividly remember being trained. And the answer to the question, uh, for example, should someone with a new seizure be admitted to the hospital wasn't, here's the evidence, it was, which neurologist is on call this month? Because they have different opinions. And you know, as an intern and resident, you're just trying to get through the day. So whatever it is, you know, if Dr. A wants them admitted, they're going. And if Dr. B wants them going home, we're going to do that too. But just tell me what I need to do. I'm all ears. Um, these days, I think what we're at least as much att attentive to in addition to eminence-based medicine, is this very, very strong beliefs that people have about evidence. Now, we get uh, to learn a lot about that. Sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose because of the reaction to uh, task force recommendations, right? People have very, very strong beliefs about prevention. Most of them are really, really enthusiastic. So anything that says maybe this we don't need to do this all the time. I'm just going to tell you, it does not make you wildly popular. I do not have a t-shirt that says, I work with the US Preventive Services Task Force, uh, for a good reason. But it's also taught us a lot about how you communicate findings that are inherently about fairly complex science uh, to multiple audiences. Um, in keeping with the theme of telling the story, uh, the authority that we have to support patient-centered outcomes research, which was actually in the Medicare drug bill in 2003, actually had two new pieces. Uh, three parts. The middle part is conduct and support research. We know that. We're a research agency. Uh, the first part says that um, the agency, the researchers don't set priorities. 
uh, stakeholders set priorities, and the needs of Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP are paramount in all of this. But we've had the opportunity to get lots and lots of input from many different groups. And the third part says that the information has to be available to multiple audiences in ways that they can use it. So that sounds a lot like John's earlier quote, right, about uh, translating the information. But it's really plain spoken in legislation. So it's actually a law, not just a wonderful quote. Um, and it turns out that's harder to do than you think. So we've actually created a center named for John that specializes in communications and clinical decision sciences. So we're stopping at nothing. They help us develop uh, mobile apps for people, uh, materials the faculty can use for continuing education, uh, consumer guides that have made me wildly popular. I've noticed as you get older, you have more and more friends who would benefit from one of these guides because that's just <laughs> stuff happens, that's all. Um, and even reaching out in unlikely places places like supermarkets and so forth to let people know about information that they can use. Now, there's no researcher who breathes who isn't passionate about making a difference in people's lives. That passion is not the same thing as the skill set necessary to communicate to people of varying degrees of health literacy um, about the multiple options with slightly different profiles of benefits and harms, really complicated. You know, I used to talk about when my husband and I had to go buy a new TV a few years ago. I'm outing us, right? We don't have cable, so there you go. So we actually had to go out and buy a new TV, and it was exhausting. You know, you're clutching your consumers' reports, and we even had a Sherpa from next door who's kind of a geek, and you know, he went to Costco with us. We even had to join Costco. When it was all done, we were like really thrilled that we could cross this off the list, but it was like really tiring. But it's only a TV. You know, to when you're talking about medications that are going to affect how you feel at work, how you feel every day, how you feel about your life, that is really hard stuff. So that's why this center, which we named for John because of his uh, prominent focus on telling the story, uh, is so important to our work. I know John would be very, very excited about the work that we do in effective health care. I'll simply say that systematic reviews that I mentioned uh, where Kathy McDonald has had a phenomenal role has been a big part of it. Uh, we've got other uh, research centers, including the Centers for Education and Research on Therapeutics. In case you're wondering, the candy mint is, they use a capital S, and we use a small s, and yes, uh, we've heard from them. Um, and just a whole variety of work, but the pipeline line ends, and what's really, really critical is the work that the Eisenberg Center does to help get the information out to multiple audiences. Now, we used to say that people, you know, didn't pay attention to evidence and they didn't use it in practice or policy. Actually, there's a growing list of organizations, communities, I think of them as one-hit wonders sometimes, who use a study or do one fabulous thing. Um, our problem is actually consistency in spreading that. And I think that our biggest home run was this project we funded in the state of Michigan. I don't think it's an accident that the dramatic results achieved in this project Understand that infections for ICU patients from the lines that we put in them to do deliver vital treatments have been around for decades. That's why Gordon Hunt said this changed our ideas of what is possible. We thought we were trying hard. Everyone washed their hands as often as they remembered to, which, and they thought that was probably 100% of the time and so forth. But they were pretty staggering, and the mortality from these infections is about 25%. So it's a big serious problem. But I don't think it's an accident that part of the reason this study succeeded uh, was an ARC grant uh, to Hopkins, but critical co-sponsors here were the Michigan Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, right? If a researcher writes a hospital CEO and says, you're supposed to send me data and you're late, all right, life is short. You know, everybody's getting a lot of mail. Get in line, right? If it's co-signed by the CEO of the Blues Plan that have a pretty dominant footprint in Michigan, I somehow think it gets to the top of the pile. And they they did a lot of other smart, practical things. Um, you know, when the this administration uh, started, they wanted to know, could we get a copy of the checklist and we should put it on the website? And somewhere on the HHS website is a copy of a checklist. 
And Peter Pronovos told me he always laughs when he hears that because every hospital believes they have a different checklist because they believe it's that important to customize, and I think they're right. The content is 99% the same, right? But uh, UCSFs is just very, very different than VAs, you know, because the, there's different labels for one thing. And, you know, the, but that level of customization and adaptability and flexibility, I think, was important. And what I think was vital to their efforts was they collected a small amount of data and the teams got quarterly feedback. You know, it's really tedious to have lots of team meetings. Uh, and a lot of doctors don't like these team meetings, you know, because after all, part of this uh, project was that the nurses could say, no, we're not actually going to put the line in unless you have all followed procedure. That's a big shift in medicine. We don't do that a whole lot. Um, so after all this tedious work, it's really helpful to know that actually the infection rates are plummeting. So you can't just put the checklist on the wall. You actually have to collect data about how you're doing. And making that part of the fabric of medicine, I think, is really a big deal. And subsequently, we worked with the Hopkins team and uh, the American Hospital Association's research group to spread this across the country to um, over 1,100 ICUs in 44 different states. What's very interesting about this, for those of you who have uh, been students of Roger's work on diffusion of innovation, is when he talks about the fact that we need more research on how the intervention has changed as a result of our putting it into practice, my colleagues right now uh, are now looking at all these results because it's very clear that the hospitals who joined later did things very differently and had to use different approaches than those who jumped on the train early. Right now it's voluntary, uh, but it does put them in good stead for the value-based purchasing that went into effect October 1 of this year. And we have seen very dramatic results in terms of lives saved, the number of infections cut, and the money saved. So um, that's been a very, very big source of excitement for us. Uh, we're also doing some great work in primary care, sort of using the agricultural model of extension agents in uh, primary care settings in four uh, different states. So we'll learn a lot about that. One thing that I'm getting, and I'm looking right at Kevin and Andy Beinman over here, is uh, everywhere you read about improving primary care, and there's a lot of excitement, the notion of coaches and facilitators comes out. Um, we don't even exactly know what that is. I don't know that we've got a standard job description. We need to learn a lot more about what are these vital folks doing. Um, and we continue to be very, very proud about the work that we do as helping people assess the weight of the evidence. Whether you're looking at expenditures for health care. You know, uh, in early 2010, when some people were pessimistic that there ever would be an Affordable Care Act, um, I knew that the Secretary's optimism was incredibly well placed because my colleagues who run this survey who make a lot of models for policymakers, when their phones and emails started lighting up, I knew this was real. I knew that uh, she wasn't just keeping our morale up, but actually they were going to pull it off, and thank God that they did. Um, or whether you're talking about the assessing the weight of uh, clinical evidence or, more recently, interventions to improve health care, whether that's bundled payments, uh, efforts to reduce health disparities, uh, public reporting, medication adherence, and so forth. Many of these reports don't give us the answers. Some of them simply clarify where we're going to need to fund more research, but they're very, very important tools to keeping the enterprise thriving. And I know John would be so, so excited about uh, health IT. He could see the power of it. He was always talking about the information superhighway being a two-way street. And we're actually starting to see that in practice. And more to the point, a lot of the work that we're funding now shows us how Anytime you go into healthcare, you are submitting data. Whether you've got a clipboard or they got you at a touch screen or you're talking to an assistant, we collect reams of it. And then we stick it in folders. Or we stick it in files in a computer and we can't get at them very easily. To be able to access that and learn and get smarter and better as we go, that is really, I think, a, a huge, huge part of moving forward. So whether it's the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program that we've been very, very excited about supporting or other kinds of efforts, this is a big way for people to know, how am I doing? It's a big part of breaking this cultural mold that I think a lot of us were trained in, which is 
all healthcare professionals were trained to see one patient at a time, do the very best you can, and move on. And if you heard that things weren't going so well, then you'd just try harder, one patient at a time, without ever looking back. Um, it's sort of like the strategy of wanting to lose weight by waking up thinner. I'm just here to tell you, it really doesn't work. But, <laughs> good idea, no harm in trying, but it isn't gonna get you very far. Um, and trying to figure out how do we make collection of data part of workflow, and the notion of looking back to see how we're doing, a part of what we do all the time, that's gonna be a really critical part of our efforts moving forward. Um, this is just a map. Um, not only are we supporting some registries or or some research based on patient registries, uh, but we're now supporting uh, research networks across the country, and many of them actually include uh, real people and uh, stakeholders in their area as part of the governance of these efforts. So these range from efforts in Washington Heights in New York City, a pretty poor area, to uh, much, much broader efforts across the country. And now what we're trying to figure out, EDM is Electronic Data Methods Forum. This is also, this is trying to make sure that we can make good sense um, out of having more data available. Making sure that we've got the right methods to know that we're drawing the right lessons and uh, insights. And so recently, many of these uh, papers and methods uh, issues were highlighted in a special uh, supplement to medical care. So you can see that methods is part of it. Some of it's informatics. What do you hear from everyone who's been anywhere near an electronic record recently? I keep putting all this stuff in and I can't get anything out, right? I hear that from people all over the place. Um, well, it turns out you can get some stuff out, but it's not easy, not easy yet. Um, and But at the end of the day, that's pretty easy technical stuff compared to governance, right? If it's uh, a cultural shift to moving from seeing one at a time to actually looking back to see how we're doing, to actually imagine that we're sharing uses of data, legally, and protecting privacy and confidentiality, let me be clear about that. Um, we don't even know how to think about that recently, really. So that's why the governance piece, if we're gonna be collecting all these data that can both be used to make my care better, maybe make my doctor's job easier, uh, maybe support research on people who have the conditions that I have so that they can do even better in the future. Oh, that's all the same data. Who writes the rules of the road for this? That, I think, is probably the hardest part of all of it, um, but also the most uh, fascinating, I would agree. Um, Speaking of electronic health records, um, although the Affordable Care Act gets a um, huge amount of attention for all of the provisions on quality and improving care delivery, uh, the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act also has some fabulous quality provisions, including uh, resources to support developing a model format for electronic health records, because there haven't been very good electronic health records that recognize the unique needs of providing care to children. So that's a bunch of bragging about ARC. We're very proud of that. We've made a good start in some areas, and there's so much more to do that it's hard not to get up every day excited about going to work. Where do we need to do better? Um, I think we need to do a lot better being able to speak in plain language about what it is that we do. Um, I'm not going to look at Dee Dee Eisenberg because she would probably laugh because I'm sure that she's heard all of the arcane terminology way too many times. Um, some people are pretty good at doing this with multiple audiences. I'm looking at Mark Smith. Um, some people want to be pretty good at it and are probably pretty good at it sometimes. And a lot of folks are nervous about being pretty good at it, right? Because if you're very, very plain spoken, that sounds like maybe you don't know know all those technical terms, and therefore you might not get the academic, you might not have academic street cred in some fashion. I don't actually understand it altogether, but occasionally when I'm trying to be very, very clear um, to everyone who works at ARC, not everyone actually knows about health services research. Some of them help us just cut checks and do that kind of vital work. Um, I can see some of the science folks, you know, almost cringing in their seats like, oh, did she just describe my work? and, you know, like non-technical terms. Um, 
We surely need to do a whole lot better in terms of disparities and health inequalities. Um, that evidence review that I cited basically says we know very, very little about how to do this systematically locally, much less how to find the right solutions that we can scale. This absolutely doesn't mean that we need to fund a lot of great studies and wait for them to harvest results. It means, I think, that we're going to have to stretch the methods we use to uh, test different methods and iterate faster, because this is a very, very urgent problem. And it's particularly urgent for young people in this country, because we've got a very, very diverse population of kids. Um, and I think that we need new models for accelerating application of evidence to practice and policy. The Affordable Care Act has a lot of evidence-based policy in it. That sounds fantastic. And I, from the time I first met John Eisenberg to working with him at ARC and so forth, you know, this is the kind of fantasy we always had, you know, that our evidence would be the framework of policy. But there's still kind of a voltage drop from writing it into a bill in very broad terms as a framework, and then turning to a group of people whose expertise is in evaluating scientific studies of a clinical intervention. And somehow it's got to get from there to insurance coverage rules. That's a big gap. There's uh, a lot of details there that are not actually, there's a gap in skill sets. That's why the stakeholder engagement is so early up front, important early up front. Um, but there are lots and lots of examples. And the other area that I've been giving a lot of thought to is anticipating the human capital needs. So practice facilitators and coaches um, is one example. In many of the studies and initiatives that we see where there's a big success, you can see that people have popped up with new jobs. Um, it might be an outreach person, right? It might be a specially trained nurse. Uh, sometimes it's stretching the job description as they did at Grady Hospital, where a, uh, the chief nursing officer made it part of a nurse's job to actually call the patient 24, 48 hours after discharge. Um, sometimes it's a whole new people coming in who aren't part of the day job. I was reading re uh, responses to Bob Wachter's blog on the way out here the other night. And uh, this is when he's trying to explain to doctors that actually assessing quality and safety is here to stay and maintenance of certification is your friend. And a whole lot of people actually weren't so sure that Bob was their friend or, um, <laughs> or that they ever wanted to be friends with him. They had very strong, very plain language um, opinions about that. But one of the ones that I really was intrigued by, Bob had made the point in his blog that, after all, pilots routinely get tested for their skills and competence. Why shouldn't we expect that of doctors? And one doctor wrote in to say, you know, my dad was a pilot, and I know exactly what you mean, but you know what? He got paid to do this. A couple of the other areas where we've seen it, we worked with the Department of Defense. This is our favorite kind of project. They gave us money, and we did the work. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that. To create a curriculum for healthcare professionals to work in teams. How many of you have ever been in the hospital? Or had a relative in the hospital, right? I mean, of course you hear the word the healthcare team all the time, right? That's all we talk about is the team. Um, I hope that some of you won't be shocked to know that the team members rarely check with each other. And on any other team, you have to actually agree on what play we're doing, right? And everyone actually knows what it is. No, our autonomous pieces don't do that. So this is a very basic curriculum, um, but it is literally being used around this country and I think in some other countries um, as well. We didn't get there through a strategic plan. Actually, the military prompted us to do that. And what got them to it was, first of all, they're big proponents of leadership and team development. And when they were fighting two wars, they had such turnover at their own facilities, they were actively worried about the care that was going on. So that's been a big success. I think the other area where I've seen a lot of work in skill development is in the use of simulation. So now everyone's got a simulation center, which is fantastic. There's a lot of good work to to figure out when do we use that, how does it work best in training, and should it be part of continuing education? You know, the agency actually had a big, big project in the field when laparoscopic cholecystectomy first came around. And this was a great opportunity. That's not why the grant was funded, but the focus shifted from what it was supposed to be and to focus on this new uh, intervention. And unfortunately, we had a chance to see um, 
how well it was done, and also, in some cases, in the very, very early days, how badly it could be done and how serious the complications could be. So it would be nice to learn from that and think about, should simulation or some level of competence be required before you start doing these new things and uh, by the new scope and so forth? So. These are things I think we need to know about. Um, and I think we've got to figure out how to communicate effectively to multiple audiences. I know my colleagues at ARC are terribly uh, bored with my saying to them when they give me a very, very long explanation, could you give me the tweet, please? Because I have to communicate it usually to folks who really don't want to hear the entire method section as part of the response. They, nor do they want to know what all the components of a watch are. They want to know know does the watch tell time. But that's uh, very much a work in progress at home. And I don't think we can do this top down or bottom up. I think it's both. Because uh, you will never, ever make sense out of the distribution of medical resources across this country. Right? I mean, why? And some of this is the basis for old, long standing jokes why there are more psychiatrists in New York City than there are in other parts of the country and so forth. But the reality is the medical landscape or ecosystem is very, very different in different parts of the country. And I think that we simply need to make sure that we're uh, adjusting for that and planning for that and recognizing that uh, many interventions are going to need to be tailored and customized uh, locally. And I would like us to get much more serious about scale and spread. I mean, now we just announce we're scaling. That's one way to do it, I guess. It is very, very hard work. And as we learned in this work with uh, the central line infections, it looks different as you move forward. You know, the people who are first on board have a different set of capacities and competencies than the people who have been waiting and uh, joined later. Later. And that's great. And we're likely to see that. Not everyone is going to come online at once, uh, but, but we have an obligation to learn from it. So I don't exactly know what this new model looks like, and I'm very interested in getting feedback from all of you, but I do feel a considerable urgency about it. We have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really change how health care is provided in this country. We've always been talking about the potential of health services research, the potential, and someday we'll see these improvements. It's right now. And I think that we have a lot of uh, what the secretary often calls uh, puzzle pieces. But we need a research enterprise that is as cutting edge as the technology that many people are using. And I got to hear a lot about that in my lunch discussion today. Um, the other quote from John, I just had to work in somewhere, so it's a slightly odd fit, uh, when he was given the Nathan Davis Award by the American Medical Association um, late in uh, calendar year 2000. This was before the election, actually. Um, he referenced the fact that this year's peacock may be next year's feather duster. And those of us sitting at a table with Didi all looked at her like, did you write that? And she said, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> So I'm going to come back uh, to this pipeline. Um, I think John had it right, and I think it's kind of an enduring way to think about it. But uh, I know there are days when many people I work with think like we need maybe a liquid plumber in that faucet. <laughs> and more seriously, we need to understand how it is that we get from what we've called translating research into practice to actually the improved outcomes, better quality, and so forth. Um, we're trying multiple levers now. I don't think any of them by themselves are enough. I think the joy that healthcare professionals get when they get it right, you can't buy that. There's no financial incentive that makes it worthwhile. But I also know that financial incentives make people uh, often get people to pay attention, and they often get financial people to free up resources to help people develop the right kinds of programs and approaches to improve care. So I don't think it's a pure uh, anything, and I don't think we know very much about how these intersect. I think anyone used alone is likely to be either futile or even dangerous, right? If you tell people we're not going to pay for harmful care, you can bet that harmful care will be abolished in about a month. 
Now, since we can't verify any of this, right, all we really know is what gets reported to us has just disappeared. So I think we need every single possible strategy that we have, but we also need to understand um, how they interact. And I'm going to just close by saying, you know, we've been saying in this field for so many years, health services research has so much potential. John always reminded us of this quote from Daryl Royal means, potential means you haven't done it yet, but we still have an enormous opportunity to get there. So I want to thank you for this honor and for your attention this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank